This event will be going until 8 p.m. So uh, my name is Sarbazad Patuzian. I will be your moderator. I'm currently a coordinator in education abroad, but I'm very passionate about Iranian American issues as an Iranian American myself. Um, I also volunteer for Omid Foundation, so if you're interested in that, let me know later on. Um, but today we will actually be talking about um, how sanctions impact women and the women's movement in Iran. Um, we have a very exciting discussion today about Iranian women that is co-sponsored by Aftab Committee, Busboys and Poets, Code Pink, Femina, and Iranian alliances across borders. Um, so we regularly hear about Iranian women in the media. We hear about their struggles against discrimination and in support of equality. More recently, we've been hearing about US officials about Iranian women as well. Um, so these have been controversial statements at times, and especially more recently because they were made at the time when um, US have been reimposing sanctions on Iran. So despite the fact that the US has imposed sanctions in the US in some shape or form over the last few decades, we rarely have the opportunity to hear about how these um, sanctions impact ordinary Iranians and especially Iranian women. Today, we will have a conversation which we hope will shed light on both these struggles of Iranian women for rights and also on, hang, on how sanctions have increased um, the threat of war impact. So um, we will also discuss um, current US policies and how they may have been escalating tensions with Iran. And finally, we will hear from our panelists um, who will be talking about um, supporting Iran and peace with Iran, preventing sanctions, as well as um, ensuring human rights and the women's rights in Iran. So today on our panel, panel we have um, Medea Benjamin. She is the co-founder of the women-led peace group Code Pink. Um, she is also the author of 10 books, including Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control, and the Kingdom of the Unjust, and Behind the U.S.-Saudi Connection. Her most recent book, Inside Iran, The Real History and the Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran, is part of a campaign to prevent a war with Iran and instead promote normal trade and diplomatic relations. Her articles appear regularly in the outlets such as The Guardian, The Huffington Post, Common Dreams, Alternate, and The Hill. Our second panelist is Susan Tahmasevi. She is a veteran women's rights and civil rights society activist who has worked for two decades to strengthen civil society and promote women's rights in Iran, MENA region, and internationally. She worked in Iran to promote women's rights, and she is the director of FEMENA, an organization supporting women's rights and defenders and women's movements in North Africa and West Asia, and particularly um, contexts where civil society space is shrinking. And our third panelist is Nazila Fathi. She is a former New York Times reporter based in Tehran and author of The Lonely War, One Woman's Account of the Struggle for Modern Iran. Our last panelist, which I'm inviting up to the stage, um, is Feri Malek Madani, and she is a film director, a producer, and a curator. For decades, she worked to bridge divides and promote understanding between the people of the Middle East and the West. Her work has been largely focused on supporting women artists from Iran. She has curated a number of successful exhibitions of Iranian women artists, and her most recent exhibition, Unexposed Wishes, is a photography exhibit by Iranian high school girls about their hopes and their aspirations. She is the director of Ah Kantaha, an organization that works to promote understanding between cultures through the arts. So we will go ahead and actually take a look at your movie, Ferry, and um, we'll go into the panel and I'll invite all the panelists but for this, or the trailer, sorry. Um, of the movie The Girls.
started to think to this project, it was in the middle of the war of Syria, and just uh, after June, <laughs> as it is going on, in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I just was astonished by the indifference of the Western countries for these people. And after um, uh, thinking a lot about that, I understood that is because there is no, there was no image of these countries except uh, those of uh, explosions, war, destruction, ruins, tears. So, I decided to give a human image to the people of my country by showing their feelings, their aspirations, their dreams, how they feel, what they love, how they hate, all these, these uh, feelings that everybody can have around the world. And especially underline how much we are the same and as the other people in the world, we had our great poet Saadi in the century, since the 13th century, who was saying already that human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasily will remain. If you had have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you, could, you cannot retain. So I wish that the next time you hear or speak uh, about Iran, you remember the images of these girls, think of the dreams and aspirations. Chuckle at what they say and uh, remember their photos and the creativity behind them. And uh, how, and show understanding for their wish to see a better world, especially a world without art. Thank you. Um, I'm going to okay, so I'm going to turn this over to Nasida. Um, Nasida, I'm wondering what is the situation of women in Iran currently? We know that they do face a lot of discrimination and they struggle with basic human rights, um, but we also know that they've achieved a lot over the years. So if you could just speak a little bit more to that.
So thank you very much for being here, John. It's a really hard question to answer uh, about women's situation in the country and the accomplishments that they have made over the past several decades. Uh, I usually like to start with a story about myself. Uh, I belong to a generation that grew up after the revolution and I went to school after the Islamic Republic came to power, introduced hijab, all the girls were forced to uh, cover their hair, wear these really uh, ugly uh, long uh, coats and loose pants to cover their body. And uh, we were told that there were these women who were called morality teachers who come to turn us into the new generation that would support the Islamic Republic. And of course, these women were very religious. They came to our school very well covered. Um, and, but they didn't seem attractive to us. We were young girls, uh, not interested in women who had come from uh, uh, far away uh, villages. They didn't speak Persian in a very eloquent uh, Persian that we were told we have to speak. And so constantly, uh, we tried to defy them. We tried not to do what they were asking us to do. And they were quite vigilant in trying to uh, convert us into God, good Muslims. They went as far as bringing down the mirrors in the bathroom so that we wouldn't be able to even look at ourselves, so that we wouldn't care about our appearance, so that we wouldn't be vain according to them. Well, none of us changed. What happened was that these women changed over the years, and gradually their head scarves began pushing back. Um, and they started wearing uh, uh, braces to purify themselves, exactly the same things that they had warned us about. And by the time I graduated uh, from high school, finished university, a lot of these women had become what we call them Islamist feminists. Uh, they were the women who were publishing feminist magazines and were feminist reporters. Uh, Shahi Mashaqat, who published Zainal magazine, was one of these women. She had been a staunch supporter of Khomeini and of the revolution. They began showing their hair. Uh, and what happened in practice was that the gap between secular women and religious women uh, had almost disappeared. Uh, by the time uh, President Khatami came to power and a lot of these women had supported him, uh, these women looked exactly like secular women. They were saying exactly the same things that secular women like Mehra and Izekar, Shirine Abadi, very prominent secular activists were saying, and they were demanding for equal rights for men and women. They were angry about the fact that the life of a woman is uh, uh, half the value of a man, her testimony in a court of law is uh, worth half the uh, testimony of a man, which means that two women should testify in a court of law so that their testimony would be equal to one human being. Uh, they were angry that women could get divorced, but their husbands could divorce them any time that he wanted, and they could get the custody of their children. Um, so I would say culturally, Iran has changed a lot. Uh, secular women and religious women want exactly the same thing. Uh, women don't believe that the Sharia Allah, the way that it was interpreted uh, for 1400 years ago, uh, should be the law of the land. But when it comes to real legal changes, the accomplishments have been very small. Um, as some of you may know, just this week, women in parliament were going to uh, uh, discuss a bill that would raise the marriage age for girls uh, to 16. Uh, they had already raised the marriage age one time. Uh, uh, girls could get married, I think, previously under the age of 13. Is that right, Susan? Susan? Previously? So now, uh, the current law says that they can be married under the age of 16 with, with a father's permission. And, and now they're trying to ban that. They're pro trying to ban uh, uh, what we call child marriage in this country. Uh, and, and they, I mean, it's going to be discussed on the floor. But what is even more important than that is a law uh, that would ban and that would introduce 
domestic violence and banned. And they've been able uh, to do nothing about that. The, the law has been stalled for five years. Last week, one of the supporters of the bill said that they went to home, uh, to the religious city of uh, 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 Iran, to galvanize support for the bill among senior clerics. And the clerics raised the issue of male authority. Uh, I mean, it sounds funny, but it is a fundamental uh, element of Shiite Islam. Men should have control over their households, and they can resort to violence to exert that uh, control. So when we talk about legal changes uh, over the past 40, de 40 years since the revolution, the changes have been very, very small. It's even hard to call them accomplishments. But if we talk about how Iranian people's mentality to what women has changed, that has been huge. Um, as a woman, I worked in Iran uh, for over two decades. I was never told that I couldn't do something because I was a woman. Uh, I was never told that I couldn't go somewhere because I was a woman. As long as I was covered, I could do anything. And you see that in different forms. I mean, a lot of foreigners have told me that when they, they were getting off the plane in Iran, the first time they were visiting, they were really surprised that women were everywhere. Women were in their face. Women are practicing as doctors, as lawyers. Uh, they are very educated, uh, they are present in society. But again, when it comes to senior management positions, to senior executive positions, you don't see that. Uh, not so much because of cultural biases, but more so because of bureaucratic uh, uh, issues. Uh, otherwise, I think Iranian society uh, has changed very drastically since the revolution. And uh, uh, in their eyes, a woman can do anything. If a woman wants to become a pilot, she can become a pilot. If there are legal restrictions that ban them from becoming one, uh, I think that's a totally different thing. Uh, but Iranian society is one step ahead of Iran's uh, legal system. Thank you for that. And as we know, as you iterated, women are starting to become more liberated in Iran. Um, and with that, I'd like um, for Susan to please tell me a little bit more about the situation with women's movement in Iran. We know that it's been really booming at this point in the last few months. And um, how are the women's groups operating? And what are they exactly fighting for? Okay, so um, so I think Nasla really gave a good introduction about the situation of women. And really, women, have, you know, whether collectively or as part of organizations or individually, they fought discrimination for, you know, since the start of the revolution, but really even before that. So over 100, we have a history of a women's movement that's over 100 years old. And we have a very legitimate human rights movement, legitimate women's rights movement, a democracy movement that dates back over 100 years. And um, the modern sort of uh, women's movements. Um, uh, I think really at the beginning of the revolution, almost immediately we went to war and women couldn't really become very active on their own behalf. We also have the turning back of women's rights immediately after the revolution. But about 10 years after the revolution and you know after the end of the war with Iraq, um, women began organizing. And at first they started writing in publications and publications like Nasila talked about, you know, so it was a a partnership between secular and religious women, really challenging the discrimination that they faced. During Khatami's period in the um, 1997, the reform period, we saw the emergence of civil society groups, organizations, which worked on independent groups working for women's rights. And they continued, even though during Ahmadinejad's period, which started in 2005, we faced great repression, civil society faced great repression, including women's groups. Many of them were shut down. Um, and in 2009, we had um, 
contested elections and we had protests like we saw across the Middle East and happened two years later in 2011, um, we faced a new period of repression, but we also faced a period where a lot of activists were forced to leave or left the country. Um, um, some people were jailed. Um, immediately after that, we saw the imposition of sanctions against Iran, and that in impacted the Iranian civil society very negatively because you know, our organizations in Iran, the majority of them don't get any funding, so people are volunteers, and when you don't, when you don't have, when you're not making money, um, or when you have to work three, four jobs, right? You don't have any time for volunteer work. So we see a retreat from civil society and the women's movement. And, um, when Hassan Rouhani, the current president, was elected in 2013, we hoped that um, he would really facilitate a good space for civil society to operate. Unfortunately, he hasn't. It doesn't mean that you know there hasn't been some openings, there has been, but we, we expected something much broader, like a national policy that allowed for people to become active. And unfortunately this happened, this hasn't happened. But what has happened with women's movement is that incredible control that we experienced during Ahmadinejad's period um, of, of women's movement. They couldn't get together, they couldn't have meetings, they couldn't travel, that ended. And with the ending of that level of control and pressure, women have begun to organize again, which is which I think is great. And they're doing a lot of really interesting work. So historically, women's groups have you know, demanded right to education, um, demanded that the legal discrimination against them end, like in the family or in the, you know, um, the, the legal discrimination, their, their, their access to the public space, um, be unfettered, so their mandatory bailing ends, or that they're allowed, you know, that they, they don't face harassment. But now, in the last few years, we see that the women's movement that's been really emerging in a very difficult time actually working very deeply. So they're addressing issues that they've never addressed before, and they're addressing issues that shows that they're working with greater tech technical expertise and just deeper. They're not, they don't, they're not very loud and vocal about what they do because they're afraid of repression at home. But it doesn't mean that they're not active. We hear a lot of campaigns outside the country, but that's only, I think we hear more about those campaigns than uh, people like myself, others who are outside, we hear more about them, but it's because people inside are choosing to work quietly so that they can continue working. But they're doing things like working with women who have HIV AIDS, women who are drug addicted, women who are homeless, they're working to prevent violence against women. Um, one group actually held meetings with over a thousand women across the country to find out what they wanted in the law. And they provided that information both to the um, deputy on women's affairs and to the parliament so that we can try to make sure that that law reflects what women really want. Another group is working with workers' rights. Um, uh, others are working to address sexual harassment in the workplace sexual harassment in the public space, they're providing shelters to women. So they're doing incredible work, they're doing research, um, but oftentimes we don't we don't really hear about it. And I think with the, yeah, I think I'll stop there and then I'll talk about how sanctions actually address it. it impacts this kind of work, this incredible, this re-emergence of the women's movement, which is so incredibly critical in this world. I just want to add something to what Nazila said, that uh, this is true that we see uh, Iranian women everywhere. Um, when you travel to Iran, this is the first thing that you notice when you go there nowadays. But a place where they are really lacking is in politics. Uh, we have only, after 40 years of Islamic Republic, we have only chapter 13 uh, MPs. Something like that. This is the most, uh, uh, we have, uh, it is 17, I think. Out of 270 uh, MPs, we have only uh, very, very few uh, women in the parliament and in politics in general. Thank you. Um, so we're going to transition into the Iran sanctions a little bit with Medea. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the Iran sanctions? Um, what's going on with the U.S. policies? Um, people did think that with the passing of JCPOA, it would help open up the economic opportunities and the politics. 
Um, but what's going on now? Could you please speak to that? Well, first let me say what an honor it is to be up here with um, such a wonderful group of women and so many of you in this room who are uh, Iranian Americans. Raise your hand if you have, uh, if you are Iranian in some part of your background. So it's majority of people in this room and you know so much more about these issues than I do. I want to speak more as an American who um, just listened today to President Trump in front of the UN talking about the campaign to isolate Iran. And while he is pretending that leaving the Iran nuclear deal is something that the international community he has made up in his own mind is supporting, uh, I think he means Israel and Saudi Arabia and maybe the Emirates. Uh, but for the majority of the world community, the, we were delighted when there was the, um, the signing of the Iran nuclear deal because we thought this was the beginning, not so much around the nuclear issue, but because it was an opening to talk more to Iran about all kinds of issues, because we thought it was an opening to deal with uh, the conflicts that have been plaguing the Middle East and maybe there would be a chance to come closer to unraveling some of these conflicts because we thought that with the signing of this nuclear deal, it might ease up the economic situation in Iran and people in Iran civil society that were pushing for more uh, democratic openings within Iran would have more of a chance to do that. So there were so many reasons to be hopeful. And then Donald Trump coming in and crashing all of those expectations and hopes. I know there are a lot of people who say that when the deal was signed and the money that was returned to Iran, that was Iranian uh, money, did not uh, make people's lives better. Uh, I don't know how much of that money went to support Revolutionary Guards and uh, activities they were doing overseas, but I also know that it takes a while before an economy can improve and that we didn't give it the chance to improve because suddenly uh, when not only when Trump was uh, elected, but as soon as John Bolton was brought in as national security advisor, that's when the companies in Europe and other places who had been doing new deals with Iran that would have brought improvements in the Iranian economy, that's when they saw the writing on the wall and they said, you know, we don't want to get in involved in this that the, uh, the sanctions that the U.S. can impose on us are not worth the profits that we could get in Iran. And so we saw before um, even the lifting, uh, the reimposition of the uh, sanctions, and of course before the next round of reimposing the sanctions in early November, uh, already so many of the big companies pulling out of deals that they were developing, whether it's the car companies like Peugeot or Renault, or whether it's the uh, oil companies like Total that had put billions into uh, developing the natural gas, uh, or whether it is the uh, companies like Airbus that were going to provide much needed improved civilian uh, airplanes that are so important for the um, uh, updating the very old uh, airplanes that are used and are very dangerous for Iranians to travel internally. Uh, all of these deals started unraveling. And uh, I see also, as part of this, uh, the inability of European governments to really protect their companies. And I think sincerely, the French, we saw Macron in the UN today uh, pleading for dialogue. Uh, certainly we have seen the uh, other signatories to the Iran nuclear deal saying that they want to keep the deal. And we even have the European Union, uh, uh, Federica Mogherini today, today or yesterday saying that they were going to uh, implement a new financial mechanism that would uh, cushion uh, European companies from the U.S. sanctions. Uh, the, the, the companies really do not want to take those risks. Now maybe, and that is to deal particularly with oil so that the financial transactions would not go through the U.S. dollar. And hopefully that will work because I think uh, come November 5th, if those, uh, the, the uh, U.S. 
proposal to drain the ability of Iran to export oil will really crush the economy in Iran. And those of you who have family back home know that it is the ordinary Iranians who are being hurt by the uh, tremendous rise of prices right now, the devaluation of the currency, um, how difficult it is to get many basic goods, including medicines, even though they are supposed to be exempt. Uh, and uh, some of you might have seen the recent interruption I did uh, when Brian Hook was at the I had seen this 17 years ago when the U.S. was paving the way for the invasion of Iraq, and we see how that turned out. And to hear the kind of uh, lies, distortions, manipulations, inventions, the way that this administration is now trying to prepare the American people to think that Iran is a threat. And I know many of you want, want to see major change inside Iran, but that is for the Iranian people to do. And we know that if the U.S. gets involved, things will be good. And in response to the uh, intervention I did, and uh, Lily, who has been reading a lot of the responses in Persian, we're so happy to have her working with us. Uh, but the responses have been a lot of people uh, uh, saying how difficult their lives have been become. So saying, I can't get married anymore because we don't have the finances to do that. We're not going to be able to have children because now we can't afford to have the children. I can't continue in my studies. And of course, if you add the Muslim ban in the United States to that, and how difficult it is now for students to even come to the United States, um, we see how already this administration is making the lives of Iranians so miserable. And of course that is part of the policy. The policy is to make Iranians so miserable that they will rise up against their, their government. Um, but I think we in the room uh, really want to know what, plan, what the plan is after that. And that's what the Iranian people want to know as well. And so I think when Susan and others talk about Iranians from the inside working so hard to change their own government, um, this is really the time when we have to stop the U.S. government from intervention, stop a war with Iran, and create, help create an opening in the space so that Iranian women can continue to fight for the equal rights that they so deserve. Thank you. Medea, you touched on how the sanctions are impacting ordinary Iranian women, and um, I'd like and men, and I'd like to actually get um, Nazida's perspective on how um, these sanctions are particularly affecting women, and since they're more vulnerable, um, if you could speak to that. So we can we can refer to a lot of um, a lot of what we say is based on really anecdotal experiences, how people are complaining about shortage of medicine, shortage of things like that. Uh, but you know, the government and the parliament both release uh, a set, sets of uh, uh, figures. And uh, it was just horrifying to see what the sanctions uh, have done to the economy. And just to go back to what Nick was said, about uh, about what happened after the nuclear agreement and there were complaints that the lives of ordinary Iranians did not improve. Uh, that might have been the case because it takes uh, a while uh, for an economy that has been under huge pressure uh, to go to a point that the ripple effects of that economy would reach ordinary Iranians. But the first year after the sanctions were lifted in 2016, Iran's economic growth reached over 12%. This is from below zero to over 12%. Economic growth here in the US is under 3% or around 3%, so that's a huge number. And it remained around 4% until this year. Until this year in the spring when the talk of sanctions uh, had started uh, going around and uh, the U.S. had already pulled out of the JCPOA. 
and economic growth dropped to around 1.8% from around 4%. And they are predicting that by next year, by next fall, economic growth would fall below zero. And this year it has already uh, dropped below zero for industrial uh, sector, for the agricultural sector, and women are active in all these sectors. Uh, women are working in the industrial sector too. Women are part of this economy. And women are the ones that if the economy gets better, they will help make it go double. So with the sanctions putting pressure on Iranian society, uh, women are the ones that are going to suffer first. They are the ones who will have to become quiet over what they want uh, in terms of more rights, in terms of changes to the law, in terms of what they want for their children. Uh, and they have no choice but to back down. I mean, for years and years, we have heard Iranian politicians say, oh, it's too early for women to start asking for their rights. I remember in the 1990s, under Khatami, a Zanon magazine, a feminist magazine, did interviews with Iranian politicians, including reformers. And every single one of them, one after another, including Abbas Abdi, they said, this is not time, the right time for women to ask uh, for more rights. They have to wait for us to make reforms, and then we will get to women's rights. Who's going to talk about women's rights under sanctions? Who's going to talk about changes to the legal system if ordinary people, sick people, the elderly, parents cannot even find diapers? They cannot find life-saving medicine. So it starts affecting everybody, including women, in very dire ways for a long time, even after the sanctions because people were not feeling the impact of economic growth even for a year, for two years after the sanctions were lifted in 2019. Can I just add something really quick to this? Like, it's very specific to women. I had a colleague of mine in Iran. We are going to we are going to try to unite it and publish it who did research about how the sanctions had impacted women's lives. This is at the end of Ahmadinejad's period and the beginning of Rouhani's period, so it really was. And she asked them if they thought that the impact was sanctions or economic mismanagement. And you know, they, they said a little bit of both. You know, definitely they both have impact. But with the woman she talked to, and she was really depressed after she did this. She did random uh, interviews with women you know, in different neighborhoods, so about 50 women, and they said, the first thing they do, they cut from their um, uh, uh, sort of like their makeup and that kind of, you know, that, that kind of stuff, right? When they don't have money. Um, then the second thing they did is they started cutting from their um, healthcare products. Um, then they started cutting from their medicine. Um, then they started cutting out of their meals, dairy products meats and vegetables so they could feed their kids. And the lengths that some of these women had gone to because of the poverty that they, many of them directly attributed to sanctions at that point, but also mismanagement during the Ahmadinejad's period, um, was, this, was astonishing and it was extremely depressing for her. And some of them had resorted to things like prostitution. So women, in order to, to feed their children, they will go to great lengths, and they suffer from poverty because they don't work at the same level as men do. They don't have the same economic benefits. They don't have the same economic cushion. And especially women who are heads of households, and they're growing in Iran, they've been growing in Iran. But I just wanted to point that, and if you know, we, hopefully we'll be able to publish this and you'll see it. We'll be able to update it with, with more up-to-date interviews and publish it. It's anecdotal, but it also reflects um, studies that have been done in places like Iraq and other countries who suffered from sanctions for a long time. So sorry, I just wanted to add that in. No apologies. Um, so Fetty, as we saw in your trailer, um, the girls, um, you work directly with women, and uh, women are emerging in the field of cinema and the arts and the cultural sector. So I'd like you to kind of speak to how women and um, have been affected by the sanctions and um, what there is to do moving forward? Um, it took um, a long time uh, for Iranian in general 
and uh, to, to get into um, uh, art and culture because um, uh, because after the war, after the revolution, the revolution didn't like very much art and culture. So we have passed ten years maybe uh, without all these things, and as uh, it has started from Khatami's era, from 2000, uh, when I say uh, uh, the smile came back again uh, on the faces of Iranians, uh, a certain hope. Uh, 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 arrived, uh, so the culture and the, especially the cinema has um, uh, has made a big um, evolution. And today, cinema is really part of the of the society of Iran. This is amazing. For example, when you go, you can go to the taxi, to the grocery, wherever you go, they are talking about the last film. Who, what, what, was it this um, artist playing well, uh, etc. Et so I mean, the cinema, this is not uh, like elsewhere. The cinema is part of the life of Iranians. And, um, and these last years, you can notice that the uh, Iranian cinema has won a lot of prizes in all the festivals around the world. And um, so uh, I'm very proud because. Last time when I went to present my first uh, fiction film in, the, in the Germany, uh, and when they present me, they said, yes, uh, the film from Iran, the country of cinema. I said, oh, this is great. How and things have changed. And as usual, in Iran, when you start to smile, there is a, a black uh, nuance. Cloud, which is coming, and uh, well, and what is happening today to the cinema in Iran? Uh, and as you know, that we have a lot of uh, women uh, directors. Uh, uh, it is um, anyhow, it is very difficult for all the people in cinema, but maybe plus for women as usual everywhere when you are in trouble, they are the first victims, and. Uh, what is happening is that, um, first of all, because of the fall of the, uh, of the currency, the, t the prices have uh, not doubled, but multiplied by three and four, 